Hi, welcome. Thank you for being here. Happy Saturday. I'm Bailey Mizell, the director of the Photographic Arts Council Los Angeles, and we're joined today by Peter Fetterman and Paula Ely uh, on the occasion of Fetterman's newly published book, The Power of Photography. Thank you for joining us today, Peter and Paula. My pleasure. Um, for all those, uh, for those of you who are just joining us for the first time today, uh, a little bit about PAC. PAC LA is a nonprofit organization that fosters the education, scholarship, and advocacy of the photographic and lens-based arts. We're made up of membership and a board of directors who are collectors, photographers, students, educators, and curators. Uh, to learn more about PAC LA, our programming, and our membership, and to join our newsletter, you can use the links that I will be adding to the chat shortly. Um, just another quick acknowledgement before I get started, I want to send a note of gratitude to our board of directors, our membership, community partners, and our sponsors. Thank you for your ongoing support and commitment to PACLA's growth, making it possible for events like today to happen and to, uh, building our community. So I appreciate that. I'll just give you a quick run of show for today, then I'll hop into introducing our panelists and then I'll return at the end to moderate our Q&A. So for the first 40 to 45 minutes, there'll be a discussion between Peter and Paula uh, on the publication, uh, followed by an open conversation in Q&A that again, I'll return to moderate at any time during the presentation, please add your questions uh, and comments to the chat in the Q&A box. And also, uh, I will be able to stop and pause if we have anything that's interesting that might be good for the conversation. We'll go ahead and get to that right during the actual discussion. Otherwise, we'll return back at the end. Um, so Peter Fetterman has been deeply involved in the medium of photography for over 30 years. Uh, initially a filmmaker and collector, he set up his first gallery over 20 years ago. He was the pioneer tenant of Bergamont Station, one of the pioneer tenants of Bergamont Station, uh, the Santa Monica Center of the Arts, when it first opened in 1994. So we're happy to have you here with us, Peter. Uh, mm -hmm. And Paula Ely is Pacolet's board president and a longtime photography collector with a focus on Latin American work. Uh, so everyone, again, I'm gonna add some chats to the, I mean, some uh, links to the chat. Please feel free to explore those. You can find where to purchase the book, find the exhibition page for, um, the current exhibition that's based on the book at Fetterman's Gallery, and some information about PAC. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Paula and Peter now, and again, I'll return for any questions during and after. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're very excited. I'm very excited for this conversation. I've known Peter for a while now, and it's always a, an interesting conversation. He has a lot to say about photography. Um, so, Peter, um, you're well known as a dealer, a ga gallerist, yes. but this book, which I'll show you the book right here, it's really beautiful, um, is really coming from the point of view as you of you as a collector. So I wonder how you um, navigate those roles. Are they kind of a flu? Is it fluid? How do you, when do you put your dealer hat on and your collector hat on? How do you think about that? I, I try to go hatless. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think there's any distinction, really. Uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, you, you start out indulging your own personal tastes and interests, and then it escalates. And then it get, in my case, it got so kind of desperate, I had to open the gallery just to deal with the collecting aspect of it. But, you know, as, as I suppose, as you get older, you, you have a different view to the word possession. Mm -hmm. uh, the attraction for photography for me and what keeps me doing it is that I learn something new. Every photograph I, I purchase, I learn something from that photograph. And you get to a certain point in your life when you say, okay, I've learned from this image. It's become part of me. I'm never going to forget it. And now it's time to pass it on to somebody else. And I suppose crudely take the money, then buy something else. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, um, you know, it's an escalator, which I cannot, I haven't found a way to get off yet. Okay. It's, it's well, a continuum. You. A continuum. I like that word. Continuum. That's a, good word. That's a good word. That's a good word. And you can continue to experience the photographs through the book, through through other ways of, of viewing the photograph. It's not always just about the object. Right. right. No, so I, we have, I, oh, go I ahead. was very influenced by photo books, you know, when I first began it became this kind of like uh, photo aerobics i had to consume so many books every day it was wow. my it was my exercise my mental exercise my uh, visual exercise my intellectual exercise so books you know were a great way for me to begin and that's how i did begin because at that time i you know i had no money 
to buy prints. I just consume books. Yeah. So Bailey, can you get the um, slideshow up? We'll get into the images. But <clears> I want to just mention, like, you have now become part of that continuum with your own book, and your you've done. This is not your first book. You've done a few, and yep. we already had someone in the chat remark how they are going through this book four pages a day, and so now you've become part of of uh, of that continuum of sharing photography through books. Just well, I I wanted it to be more of a kind of intimate object, and and the way I, we put the yellow ribbon in the book, I think it's a book that people don't consume once and then forget about. Mm -hmm. uh, the ideal reader is somebody who does take it, go slowly with it, learn something from it, goes back to it. That that's what it's that that was my dream for the book. So hopefully that's happening. Wonderful. Well, there are many, many um, images in here, over 200 pictures, I think, in here. It's, it's 120, which- oh, 120. Uh, oh, which you know hard, what? It was, it was hard to edit it down to, to that <laughs> number because <laughs> I think on my little daily blog now, we're up to like 730. Oh my God, oh and my God. I can't seem to stop doing it, so <laughs> God knows where it will end up. Uh, well, we've made a selection of about 10 that we can look at today. We thought we would look at the stories through of some of these images and how they've impacted you and your experience with them. So if we could go to the first one. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Um, it's actually the Roman Vishniak. This one. Yes. So this, this image, um, which I actually didn't know this image before the book. Um, but you tell the story of how this was an important uh, piece of your own photographic journey in history. So can you tell us the story? I, I think this is the first image that seduced me. Um, I was 15 years old. I pick up this book called A Vanished World by Roman Vishniak. And on the back of the book is this image called Sarah, the only flowers of her youth. And it just totally blew me away, especially the story of how Roman Vishniak went into the Warsaw Ghetto with a hidden camera. And this, to me, is the strongest. This was the first image that I thought, wow, what is this medium? I can't stop thinking about this image. And the story is that, you know, it, this is a tiny apartment in the Warsaw Ghetto. This kid has never been outside this room. And her father painted some images of flowers on the back of the wall. And that's why the title, that's why it's the title, The Only Flowers of Her Youth. And this kid, along with everybody else, basically in the ghetto, was sent to the camps and exterminated. And so flash forward, you know, five years, I managed to scrape some money to go to New York for the first time. Being an English kid, I was always obsessed with America. And I don't know what possessed me, but I, back in those days, there were things called the yellow pages. I look in the telephone book, I see R. Vishniak. I just, something is going on with me. I have to meet this man. I call him up. I say, Mr. Vishniak, I've just arrived in America. It's my first day in America. I was very moved by your book. Could I meet you? He said, I'm very busy. Come around tomorrow. I'll give you 10 minutes. So I go and meet Vishniak. And that was the first real live photographer who I'd ever met. And the 10 minutes ended up turning into like six or seven hours. And I spent the day with him. He was like the grandfather I never knew, an amazingly inspiring man. And I looked so hungry, his wife kept feeding me for seven hours. <laughs> and that, that was my first introduction to photography. It's incredible. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's incredible. This is such a picture of great sadness and uh deprivation um and it's interesting to me that 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 moved you so much that you wanted to to know this person who had made this photograph i i think i suppose in a way i kind of identified with it because my my upbringing was pretty humble and you know we you know it was a very simple environment my parents both left school when they were 13 years old there were no books, there were there was no music. There was, you know, we, we lived a very basic, simple life. So I always sensed there was a, a bigger world out there. And I started to explore that world through reading, through going to movies, through the theater. 
and looking at photo books. So it was my escape too. And uh, that's why it's a very personal association. Yeah, really beautiful. So um, moving into a new direction, Bailey, if you could bring up the Max Yavno picture, which is the first, this one. So now we have Hollywood. Now we have a very different kind of image. This is a movie premiere and the Klieg lights and the cars and uh, this beautiful uh, fantasy. And this is another image that was important in your in your uh, learning, your your initial initiation into this world. So can you tell us this story? Yeah, I mean, I, I had arrived in Los Angeles in 1979. I'd made a couple of little independent films in England because that was my, my my profession then. And, you know, I got tired of struggling in England and I thought I'd come to America for two weeks. So I come with like $2,000 two pairs of jeans, a couple of t-shirts. And my second day in Los Angeles, I end up meeting somebody who, who says, why don't you come to dinner tonight with some friends? So we go to this guy's house and it turns out he was a photographer and he had a small collection of photographs on his wall. And it also turned out that he collected cars and his wife said, you can't buy any more vintage cars till you sell these photos. So it turned out the, this collection of photos was for sale. And I timidly, I was attracted to this image because to me, as a young starving filmmaker, this was the epitome of Hollywood success and fulfillment. And I quietly asked, well, how much is that photograph? And he said, it's $400. And then something irrational uh, happened to me. I said, I'd like to buy it. And I literally had, I think $2,000 to my name. I was driving a beat up Pinto that had no brakes. I should have spent the $400 on getting brakes fixed, but I bought this photo instead. And this changed my life. This, this absolutely was a moment of epiphany, of destiny. I felt so happy being surrounded by this silver piece of paper. And that's what got me started. And then I subsequently met Max Shevnu, who I thought was a great photographer, kind of a grumpy man, sadly. It was certain, you know, you meet certain artists who are their own worst enemy, but he was a great, great photographer. And this to me obviously has a lot of sentimental and life value. So was this your introduction? Your your previous experience was was with the book. Right. Yeah. And so this is a print. This is a silver gelatin. This print. is the this first is... physical photograph I, I ever bought. And it was in a way alien to me because I never thought I could ever become a collector. I mean, to me, collectors were the Rothschilds, you know, the Gettys, the Fricks, whoever. You have to come from enormous wealth to become a collector. And that's when I realized that photography was a democratic medium. It could even if you came from a very humble background like me, you could still become a collector somehow. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was maybe easier back then, but I still think there's enormous opportunities. I, you know, I, I would love to have a Mondigliani. I would love to have a Degas. I would love to have a Bonnard painting, but that's not reality for me. Um, so th that's why photography is great. It's open, it's democratic, it's accessible, it's not elitist. You don't have to be Mr. Frick. Correct. Mr. Yeah, to, I think that's what attracts a, a lot of us to to the medium is that you can you can actually participate in a in a very serious way without those kinds of resources. Um, you still can. That's what's great. Okay. That's why it's the medium of our time. Yeah. And everybody listening can become a collector if they're not already. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so let's move on to the next image, if we can, which is um, Dan Budnick, March on Washington, it's a beautiful photograph of Martin Luther King. Um, so the full title of this is something like March on Washington, uh, or what Martin Luther King after delivering his I Have a Dream speech, Lincoln Memorial, Washington, D.C., 28 August 1963. So I feel like he wants us to know that this was that moment. That well, this, was, this shot was taken, you know, literally seconds after King celebrated I Have a Dream speech. 
and I was working on curating a, a civil rights show for the gallery. I'd always been interested in, in civil rights. Um, even as, a, as an English guy, it, it was amazing to me how the injustice of, of America was, was still rampant, it still is. And that's why I wanted to do a show. And you can't do a civil rights show without a great portrait of MLK. So I spent a long time searching, hunting, going through so many photographs. And then I came across this one and I didn't know who Dan Budnick was, but so I called him up, we get together, we become friends. And he had an extraordinary body of work about, on civil rights. So this to me, this is what the image that anchored that exhibition. And um, I, look at it, I look at it every day. It's just humbling and powerful and just beautiful. It's so. true. It really shows his, his humanity for sure, aside from the iconic nature of his presence. Yeah. But he has, this is a person who's been photographed a lot. So many right? times, like Marilyn Monroe, as many photographs of, yeah. but th this to me has such a, a grace, a quiet dignity. Uh, it, it's haunted me ever since I first saw it. And uh, I live with a print of it in my house. It, 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 it inspires me. You know, when I think I'm having a bad day, forget that, you know, right. this is, puts everything into perspective, you know, getting stuck on the 405 freeway is not a bad day. Right. Compared to everything else. Right. We're fortunate to be stuck there. In a, we in, are. In a sense, right? Um, so I want to just keep us moving through these images so that we have, make sure we have time for them all. So um, another beautiful Elliot Erwitt from Valencia, Spain. This one has an interesting backstory as well. Yeah, so um, Elliot was a friend of Robert's and they were, Elliot was on leave from the army and he came to visit Robert and his wife. Robert. Robert Frank. Thank you. This is Robert, the Robert Frank <laughs> in this photograph. And, you know, Elliot is sleeping on the couch and he wakes up and he sees them just doing this in the kitchen. And it's, you know, for a romantic like me, this is a, a beautiful, beautiful, uplifting, wonderful image. And having subsequently got to know Elliot pretty well, an, an amazing man, amazing photographer, totally underrated. Uh, this is such a beautiful photo. And it's a tender, again, there's a tenderness to this image. And I think I'm attracted to a lot of tender photos. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of a stolen I get, moment. I get criticized for sometimes. But well, it's okay, I know. mean, everybody gets criticized for something, right? But um, I mean, I think the, the words romantic and <laughs> optimistic are probably not, you know, art historical curatorial uh, designations of quality, maybe. Okay, but, uh, but you've talked about this. And I mean, in your synopsis, uh, uh, of, to this book, you talk about photographer. I'm going to quote you: the photographer's ability to ignite emotions across barriers of language and culture. Yeah. Right. And I've heard you talk about this before: that you love beautiful images, that you want to be surrounded by beauty. I do. So can you talk about about that motivation a little bit? I think you know, as I say, and as I always say, I think autobi you know, collecting photographs is all autobiographical. So it's I, you're attracted to an image because it resonates with you as part of your life story, or maybe part of your aspirational life story. And that's what I like to be around beautiful things. I think there's so much sadness and violence and despair in the world. Um, this is my form of self-protection from that. Hmm. So my collecting is my own little private Idaho. <laughs> it may not be total reality, but it, it helps get me through the day. And that's okay. I don't, I don't think that's a bad drug. No, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Um, but you say you've been criticized because do images like this somehow, what, don't? I, I think maybe in the art historical canon or maybe people think it's a little bit sentimental mm -hmm. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with the word sentimental or beauty actually and you know 
the medium can make everybody happy. Everybody can choose what kind of images they would like to live with. I just happen to like to live with these images. <laughs> I mean, I, they're not, I don't think they're sickly sentimental. Uh, I think they're tender. I think there's a difference. And I think we all need to show tenderness towards each other, even more so now, and respect and tolerance and just embrace. We're, we're all the same people, really. Mm, true. True. Um, okay, let's go to the next image. Uh, so, yeah, so. This is Kurt Marcus, Hooded Man. This was not a photographer that I knew before seeing this book. Um, it's a really striking image. Um, I did a look, quick Google search on him and apparently he did a lot of different kinds of photography, including fashion, well, yeah, right? I mean, and this I was think, originally a fashion piece. Yeah, Kurt made his living as, as, as a fashion photographer. You know, he also did an extraordinary body of work about the West, about cowboys. And me, you know, as, as an English guy who, you know, had never been on a horse, you know, I got attracted to his images. And but this image of Hooded Man just haunted me. And I started to work with Kurt, who sadly passed away literally uh, just a couple of couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, Kurt, uh, you know, I love platinum prints. I love this image. Why have you never produced this image in platinum? So we, we, we funded the production of the platinum prints. And it's one of the most beautiful platinum prints I've ever seen. It's one mm -hmm. of the most beautiful images. It's just very haunting, simple, graphically very satisfying. And I love it. So in the, in the exhibition, you know, this image is facing the previous image of Martin Luther King. Mm. And, and it's a powerful juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. Um, I do, I see his vulnerability in this image. The black man in a hoodie is a vulnerable yes. person. And I sure. really um, see that in this, in this photograph. I mean, you um, can, you can delve deeper into more layers of meaning of it. You may, in, in your thoughts, reference the Ku Klux Klan. I mean, there, there's, it's a great image. It provokes thought. And that to me is what makes an image great. It's yeah. an image you can't easily forget once you encounter it. So you mentioned this is a platinum print. So let's talk about the print for a moment. So there's the platinum print. There are silver gelatin prints. There's these yeah. photographic objects. But we're seeing in the book, we're seeing these, uh, you know, book, you know, printed in, printed to the page. Yeah. Right. And on your in your process over this the pandemic of doing these via email, we're experiencing them digitally on email, on a screen or on your phone. So how do you, how do you feel, or how do you kind of think about the, the medium as a part of the experience of an image? Well, I, I think when you're standing physically next to a beautiful physical print, a silver print, a gelatin print, a gravure, a platinum print, I think there's no substitute for that, but given the the next best thing is to have beautiful images in a beautiful book, which will hopefully encourage you to visit your local gallerist, your local museum. Any, you know, I feel a bit like I'm an evangelist. I have to spread the word. It's my passion. It's where I put my energy every day into it. So if you give me a, a church or a platform, I'd love to speak at it. And that pre-pandemic time was my life. We were, you know, some, some years we did eight, nine, 10 art fairs a year. That was our way of promoting what we believed in. So that was my lifestyle. And I could never have done this book if, I, if that lifestyle was continued, you know? So, so what we, generated this project to begin with? What, what made you decide that you wanted to do this daily it was fear yeah. and panic. I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting at my kitchen table. The world has shut down. The gallery has shut down. No one's going anywhere. No one's coming to visit. And I thought, oh my God, what am I gonna do? This is the end. And then the words, the power of photography just reverberated in my brain one morning as I'm eating my cornflakes. And I thought, okay, 
why don't I do five daily little blasts about an image that means something to me and the memories that these images evoke? And I thought I'd do it for five days and then I would pack it in because nobody would care. But for some bizarre reason, uh, people keep kept telling me that these little images help them get through the day. And can I please continue? Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. And it was total fluke. It wasn't planned. It was an accident. But maybe the photo gods up there were shining down on me and giving me a way to survive emotionally and physically and keep keep the gallery somewhat alive when no one could visit it. So I, I, it was a blessing. I I think we're still kind of figuring out what this pandemic has meant for, for all of us. And I think we'll continue to try and figure it out for a long time to come. So uh, the, the, my these little daily blasts help me and it seems like it helps other people. So I'm very humbled by that and grateful for that. Yeah, so if there are those who are uh, watching this who are not receiving these and would like to, what should they do? They should just go on our website and sign up to receive the daily power photography letter. Okay, well, that's easy. Very simple. Peterfetterman.com. Correct. Okay. If you, to, if you go to our homepage, all the images have been archived. So there's 730 plus now, and you can sign up to receive it every day. And you can delete it afterwards. I won't get upset if you, <laughs> if you say, oh my God, I can't look at another photo every day. Feel free to unsubscribe. Okay. But most That's... people don't, and most people send them on to their friends and family. And so we've generated a nice little community who appreciates photography. Wow. So you're continuing to do this. You yeah. published the book. You said you were, you're up to 700 and something, but there are 120 here. Yeah. So how did you, I guess there, I have two questions. One is how did you make your edit? And then where do you, or is this going to go on indefinitely? Well, I think I'm afraid it is. I can't stop doing it. Um, <laughs> it's become part of my daily routine now. And if I don't do it, I know I'll be letting a lot of people down mm -hmm. and I'll be letting myself down. And it also puts even more pressure on me to go hunting for even more great images, fresh images. And, and I think maybe the, the reason the, the book works is as it's it's there's very famous iconic images in it and there's also completely unknown images in it and that's that's what's great for me so i'm it's helping me keep hunting i can't stop maybe you'll take over paula if i get oh my goodness tomorrow. i'm oh, gonna well. hand the bat on to you <laughs> okay we'll discuss that later um let's move on to the next image Shall we? Thank you, Bailey. So this is so charming. Uh, from the movie Breathless, a boot de souffle, right? Yeah. Um, and I read the story that you shared about this. Um, why don't you tell us? Oh, you went. Oh, that's right. You went. You saw this. You tell it. Sorry, <laughs> you tell it. Well, you know, as 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 a young kid, was obsessed with cinema. Uh, you know, Truffaut was my god and Godard and all those French New Wave filmmakers. And this was my fantasy shot. And uh, I, I'd i always loved this image. I then, uh, I actually was trying to do a, a, a movie, which was an Anglo-French co-production. And in, in the course of five days in Paris, I met every single great French actress, including Jean Seabourg. Um, mm -hmm. So the movie never happened, of course, as, as lots of movies never do. But this image stuck in my mind. And I was finding it very, very hard to find Raymond Colchetier. He had no phone number. He had no email. He had no website. And I get introduced to him by a, a great Hollywood cinematographer called John Bailey, who was also a major collector. And I end up meeting Raymond. And it was like a dream come true to meet the man who took this image. He was in his 90s then, and he lived in the same 
uh, five-story walk-up apartment that he was born in. So literally, I'm climbing these stairs, and I get to his apartment, and I'm breathless. You know, I just yeah. And, but we, <laughs> but we had a great, great meeting, and we 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 started to work with him. And, and I, he's got a great body of work. If you love cinema, this body of work is extraordinary. But he was like a set photographer, is that right? He was a set photographer, but this isn't a steal from the movie. So he had his own vision of how he wanted to portray the essence of, of a film and its storyline. And, you know, they'd broken the set for a few minutes. He asked Belmondo and Seberg, just come walk with me down the Champs-Élysées, off the set, just be natural. And he captured basically what is the essence of that movie. Um, so he was brilliant. And it just makes me feel good. If you love cinema, if you love Paris, you know, and you love Belmondo, there's, there's a, that little swagger is, is incredible. And she's unbelievably beautiful. And it's it's a wonderful romantic moment. It is. It is. Um, something that I've noticed, and I see this in the Q&A as well, is uh, you do have a smattering of color photographs in the book. Yeah. But by and large, they're black and white. Yes. Tell me, what it, what is it about the black and white that appeals to you so much? I think, you know, you're either a color person or a black and white person. I, I To me, the storyline, the impact of an image seems more stronger, stronger in black and white. Like if you look at, take a movie like Raging Bull, you can't imagine that film being shot in color. I mean, it's just one of the most brilliant black and white movies of many you know recent years it, it it has an impact I suppose it's maybe it's the first images I ever were attracted to were black and white and so it's that continuum for me I, I like color photography we have we work with color photographers uh, I, I'm not prejudiced against it but by and large the impact for me seems to be stronger but that's personal it's you know we're all we all have our own personal tastes, our own preferences. And it's not to say that black and white is more important than color. It's not. It's the image that's important and the execution of the image. And certain images work well with, in color. I mean, we work, I've worked closely with Steve McCurry for, you know, 30, 40 years. Extraordinary man, extraordinary talented. And I love his work. So that's why it's in the book. And that's why, you know, I, I'm not rigid in my, <laughs> I don't say I'm only going to like a, a black and white photo. I'm only going to purchase a black and white photo. Not true. Okay. But there's still a, a majority. Yeah. Does this, um, do you prefer black and white cinema? Well, because I was brought up in that era. I mean, the first film I think that totally devastated me was The Grapes of Wrath. Mm. Uh, that was black and white. And movies like Breathless and all the early Truffaut movies, 400 Blows, Julie Jim. It's black and white. I, I, I suppose I see in black and white. I see life as in black and white. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, let's move on to the next, next one. Oh, it's a black and white photo, Paula. Oh, imagine, imagine that. <laughs> I mean, this is one of the greatest black and white physical prints I've ever seen taken by uh, our friend, Paul Caponegra. It's an extraordinary image. And, and Paul, I think, is one of the great 20th century, totally underappreciated, totally undervalued photographers. And he'd had some health issues and he wasn't able to go on location. And he was coming out of these, these health issues. And this was the first image he took, having regained his uh, strength and energy. And it's just stunning to me. And when you stand in front of a physical print like this, and I suppose we, we do get into the discussions about digital versus silver, this to me is what it's about. This is the power of photography. The nuances in this print are just extraordinary. Well, I imagine looking at two pairs in a wooden bowl and then looking at this photograph, and they're not the same. They're right? not the same. I mean, there's an intensity yeah. There's a beauty to this. I mean, the subject matter, I suppose, if you look at it analytically, is pretty trite. But Paul has managed to produce an image of such power. 
from these two simple objects. It's extraordinary. That's that's why he's so great. He can take an everyday op object like an apple and turn it into something very spiritual and hypnotic and magnetic, which is what this print is. Uh, to me, these pieces of fruit almost look like a body. These, yeah, these I mean, well, it, shades. well, maybe it's two people together. You know, the, it's an intimate image. It's it's very moving, and maybe that's my sentimental romantic uh interpretation of this image but it's it's pretty powerful for me it's quite beautiful and you you quote uh or you say that cap negro had told you that he was trying to capture emotions yeah. he's always trying to capture emotions rather than the subject matter i mean and he's so... a very emotional man he's a mm. deeply sensitive attuned to nature when when you're with him you know you're in the presence of someone really special mm -hmm. and that's been the joy of my life in this journey through photography photographers are extraordinary people they really are i mean uh, i know a lot of movie directors but there's something about being able it's like a, being a great writer you can take you can create something from absolutely nothing and that's what the great photographers do and have done and will continue to do so let's talk a little bit about you've had relationships with photographers for yep. your whole career and something that i notice is that a lot of these photographers live to be very old they live well into their 90s and they continue to work and what what is the connection there why do you think that's the case i think you know unlike cinema which is a collaborative art you can you can do you can create your own art as a photographer on your own you you're not dependent on vast sums of money uh to to fulfill a project you're free and you're constantly looking and walking and traveling and being open to to life and the really great photographers i've ever met are deeply well-read men and women i mean they're extraordinarily broad in their interests and that's what stimulates them i mean when you meet somebody like ruth bernhard or eve arnold i mean extraordinary people with such a depth of knowledge which they bring to their work so yeah. they're worldly in a sense but they're also childlike and they're free hmm. Good, good lesson to be learned there, perhaps. I think so. Um, um, okay, let's move on to the next one. I want to make sure we're staying on time. Ah, well, wow. I okay, so I'm, I'm attracted to Paris, Paula. Yeah, you okay. can, I've got, you know, uh, this is another great French photographer called Sabine Ruiz, who sadly passed away last year at the age of. Mm -hmm. 97 another extraordinary woman i mean strong and great passion great energy and great talent and this image would mean nothing if it wasn't shot in the rain right it, yeah. that's the magic of this image and yeah she was a magical person i, I was really like with vishni I, she was like the grandmother i never had i just enjoyed being with her and learning from her the, the great pleasure I have in, in what I do is I learn from people. They teach me something every 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 encounter. You know, great you photographers know. are great, great philosophers, great sources of wisdom. Hmm. Uh, they should be you put know. on a pedestal. I look at this and I think that I want to be there, but you know, slogging around in the rain and the traffic is not really that romantic of an experience usually right but i feel because there's these raindrops on the glass yep. that somehow i'm in the nice warm cafe yep and looking out at this moment there's, there's something very moving about it yeah i mean she's moving the rain is moving the car is probably about to move if it isn't it's just going very slowly mm -hmm. it evokes uh, a whole ambiance it's cinematic and I, there again, I suppose my early love of cinema 
passes on to my selection of images. I like images that in a single frame tell a story. Mm. So for me, the attraction of photography is it's like reading great novels. You're reading great stories every time you look at a great one. Okay, let's move on. I think we've got a couple more here. Uh, oh, yeah. Another great French photographer. Here we go. This is this is Sarah Moon, who, to my mind, is in a class of her own. Uh, she's just an incredibly sensitive, mystical, romantic perfectionist. And when you're with Sarah, you know you're in the presence of someone great. She lived in a, in a house in Paris, uh, in the middle of the city, but you think you're visiting a Lewis Carroll house in the English countryside. It's wow. just magical. And she is magical. And this is one of my all time favorite fashion photos. Just the gesture, just the tone of the print. I think it's a, a, a masterpiece. It's like a great Degas painting. So was it, so it's a fashion photo, uh, photograph. Was it made for a client? Do you know? I think it was made for Chanel, but whenever Sarah is working, I mean, she's the most in demand. Every great designer wants Sarah Moon to shoot their mm -hmm. campaign because <laughs> they know she will create something so special that millions and thousands and millions of people would like to buy the clothes. But I think maybe this was a personal moment within that shoot. And she started life out as a model. So she understands what it's like to, to pose. Mm. And she brings her own experience in her communication with her models that makes something special. Um, I'm intrigued by the title. And my French is pretty poor. But L'Inconnu, is this like the unknown, unknowable? It, it's unknown, which allows you as, a, as the viewer to bring your own interpretation of this image. Um, we don't know anything about this woman. Mm. We don't really know her story. So it's, we're just, well, I'm seduced by it. I want to know more about the story of this woman. Um, it's just beautiful for me. Yeah, it's definitely intriguing. Um, okay, let's continue. Well, <clears throat> okay. Another one that you've worked with for a long time, Sebastian Salgado. Yes. I mean, we, we were introduced oh, 35 years ago by Cartier Bresson. And I suppose my relationship with Sebastian has been my longest relationship with any photographer. And he's an amazingly stimulating, great man to be around. And this is my favorite image from his latest project called Amazonia. Uh, the museum show will open here in Los Angeles in October. Mm. But to me, this is like a great old master painting. It's, mm. it's got great dignity. And what makes Salgado Salgado is that he he lives with his subjects for weeks on, on end before maybe he actually takes a photograph. So he understands the story of who he's photographing and their situation. So he became part of this tribe and he lived with them, eats with them. He understands them. And here again, this is like a, an old master painting for me. Pretty atypical for him, but special. It is unusual for him, isn't yeah. it? I like her bare feet. Yeah, I think that's what makes it. And the makeup and, and the simple feathers around her, her neck and her jewelry. So she's obviously maybe wants to explain to Sebastio her traditions, her rituals. And he does this with such great respect and humanity. Lovely. Okay, we're gonna let's let's keep going because I think we have do we have just a couple more? This is like such a fun yeah. Such this a fun is, well, this is my favorite William Klein photograph, and it was shot in a Russian bath in Paris. And I just love the attitude of these women. And I think it's a beautiful, beautiful photo. And, you know, just accept me as we, as I am. It's, it's, it's just works on, it's Fellini. And, mm. uh, it's, mm -hmm. but very human and beautiful and powerful. 
And again, that key word, haunting. I think once you see this photo, you don't forget it. I've never forgotten it. So. I mean, it's a community of women, which is yeah. not something that we see all of the time. Uh, I love this leg in the foreground. Yeah. And it, just the attitude. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I think it's an extraordinary piece. It's beautiful. There's a lot to look at. A lot to look yeah. at. Um, okay, we have one more, and then we're going to go to um, some questions. So Cartier-Bresson is another important relationship, I believe, in your professional life. My, my relationship with Henri and Martine completely changed my life. Uh, they were so gracious to me, and they introduced me to so many other wonderful photographers who I ended up having the honor to work with. So they introduced me to Salgado, they introduced me to Willy Roni, to Bouba, to Duano. So mm -hmm. I became, I suppose, the French connection in, in, in America. I, I wanted to champion all these great photographers. And this is how we end the book. And this is a portrait of uh, Martine Henri's wife, who was an extraordinary woman, incredibly intelligent, gracious, loving very helpful and wonderful to me. So without these two people, I don't think I would have had the career I've had. So I'm incredibly grateful to them. And this is their cat, Ulysses. And because uh, Joyce's book, Ulysses, was Henri's favorite book, and he quoted it all the time, and he was obsessed with it. So they named their cat Ulysses. <laughs> in tribute to James Joyce. And wow. it's a beautiful shadow. And this is a this is my personal, you know, life story in one frame. Without these people, I wouldn't have a book or be here or talking to you now. So wow. it's, it's my little homage to two great, great photographers and great human beings. Wow, that's wonderful. It's a it's a very personal image, right? It's the it's the whole it's the it's her image in shadow, right? And the yeah. and the cat and their home and their furniture. And they oh. lived so incredibly simply. You know, when I first met them, I was very nervous about going to to meet Henri. It's like meeting Rembrandt if you love painting. It's it's a god, but their their apartment was incredibly simple, and no photographs anywhere. Just a mm. little little Matisse drawing, a little Giacometti drawing, and those were their friends and just wonderful, the greatest people I've ever met in this, in the photo world, actually, I have to say. Wow. And, um, and such, such important figures, both of them, really. Well, just important, you know, considering, you know, Henri's, what he achieved and what Martine achieved, and what and how much they helped everybody else, myself included. They're 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 the greats. They're, they're my gods. It's a nice legacy. Yeah. You see. So uh, we did kind of go quickly through these, but I wanted people to at least get a sampling of what's in the book. There are many, many uh more with lots of personal stories and interesting stories. Um, we have a few questions about your favorites. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite all-time image? Oh, that's such a hard question. Um, I mean, I, I, I've, you know, I've had some favorites which I've been obligated to sell over the years just to survive and keep the gallery going. But I suppose I have to the front cover, the the Max Chavano photo. Mm -hmm. I think that and the first image. And the last image in the book, the Cartier Bresson, mm -hmm. and the Vishniak. If I had to, if you're <laughs> twisting my arm, Paula, and make, say, what are my three favorite images in this book, or perhaps all time? I think these yeah. three would be up there. Okay. Um, there's a personal story here from Gary Rickwald, who has a copy of that, who owns an image, owns that Sarah image. Right. Um, and he said. Um, we were lucky to acquire this photo from his daughter, who explained that the stenciled roses were meant to create an image of wallpaper that was popular at that time yeah. and create some normalcy yeah. in the midst of a very difficult situation. Um, Thank so you, Gary. I mean, yeah, I think the father did 
that act to paint those flowers for his daughter because he knew she would never be able to see real flowers and he knew that that was what's was going to happen what was going to happen to them because there was no way out and that's one of the great you know human tragedies ever so that's a gesture that a father does for his daughter out of love and maybe to give some temporary hope to her knowing full well that probably there is no hope but so that's why it haunted me and that's why it got me involved in photography it's really really a devastating picture but yeah. also you know what a parent will do for a child it's a parent would do would, a parent will do anything for their child to to comfort them and make them happy i mean i know that <laughs> Also, how much the photograph is moving people still. So yeah, right. it still yeah. is, and it always will. It is one of the greatest photos I've ever seen, and mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen too many more that have even more impact than that for me. But that's what it's about, right? Yeah. Finding the next great Vishniak image that does that to you. I know they're out there, and I'm going to find them. <laughs> you share them with all of us too. That's an important part of your role too. Um. Yeah. We have a good question in the chat here, Paula. Do you want me to pose it or would you like Go to? Go ahead. Go um, ahead. It says, it's, it, it is beautiful to hear the love Peter feels for the prince, but even more important for the photographers. Such a joy to listen to Peter. Have you ever fallen out of love with a photograph? Have I ever fallen out of love with a photograph? Yeah. Um, or have I ever fallen out of love with a photographer who took that photograph? <laughs> uh, that's a different question that's a different question <laughs> i don't think so i don't think there's something i ever regret purchasing the, my only regrets are the photos i didn't purchase when i could have maybe could have bought them mm -hmm. but i just didn't have the money um i remember one wonderful occasion at sotheby's uh, in london there was a group of great lewis carroll children's photographs that I just lusted after and I think at the time they were something like four thousand dollars and I mm -hmm. it was like reaching for the moon I just didn't have the money at the time so those are the ones you feel sad about the photos you didn't buy I've never really felt sad about any photograph I've bought yeah. there's always a few that got away right yeah, well that's that's <laughs> That's what makes you hunt even harder, right? That's right. what keeps you going. Right. You know, it's always the next great photograph that you may find when you least expect it. And so, as I say, the only mistakes I've made are the photos I didn't buy. So I encourage you all, if you see something that moves you in the way that these photographs have moved me, you know, at your, your local gallery or auction house or whatever, just go for it. Don't 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 overanalyze it. <laughs> um, and I, when I started out, I remember having a, meeting a, an old master painters dealer, and uh, he said, "Peter, I'm going to give you some words of advice in your new career." And I said, "Well, what's that?" And he said, "Peter, you never overpay for something great," and <laughs> that's been my mantra all along. That mm -hmm. even though I couldn't really afford to buy it. I would find a way, you know, to do it. So um, if something moves you, find a way to do it because it will enrich your life. Right. It's only money. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, it's, it's an exhibition currently, right? So if you talk about uh, providing a space for the works to be seen that maybe they wouldn't have had access to seeing them before and, and what that's... Yeah. I mean, we we now have uh, you know a hundred the hundred and twenty photographs from the from the book up on the wall, and it's even to me it's it's kind of a powerful experience to see them all up on the wall, as opposed to me, you know, looking at them in my boxes. So right. it, it it's powerful. Yeah. I think what what's the phrase? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. When you actually see them all together. And the, the diversity of, of the images from very well-known photographs to totally anonymous ones. It is the power of photography. Yeah, yeah. How long is the exhibition up for, Peter? It is up to September the 3rd. 
but we, we, will, we will continue a smaller version of it to the end of the year. Wonderful. All right, so those who are local can go yep. uh, see some of these in person. The other, uh, all, the, all the others who should fly in to see it. Okay. <laughs> I will, I will refund your airfare if it's a disappointment. There oh we are. my, well, okay, that's a big promise. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh. Well, if there aren't any other thoughts or questions uh, that we can- There's one more, there's one more what? here about the scale and the size of prints. Okay. And uh, does that have an impact on, on your experience? Do you think it, does it matter what size? Because again, we're, we see things on our screen, we see them in the book, but sometimes artists print large sometimes they print very intimate small pictures just what do you think about that idea i think certain images perhaps have more of an impact when they're larger but my preference is for small photographs mm -hmm. because you know yeah. i like to take them with me when i you know when i visit somebody if i make a house call i i like small images yeah. and i think often size particularly under several contemporary photographers it size becomes a, a gesture in itself and it's totally meaningless uh, i get as much pleasure from a carte de visite as from a eight foot by 20 foot large digital print and i often think certain contemporary photographers just make it large for the sake of making it large because they maybe can ask more money for it if it's large or the dealer can so I think it's all nonsense. An image is either great because it conveys an emotion and making it large is not going to make it great if it's not great to begin with. So I, like I don't think size that. matters. I like how you answered that, Peter. Um, I think that a smaller piece has more of a I'm sure I'm going to get a lot of flack now from no. the contemporary photographers <laughs> who make large prints. And well, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a lot your of- your perspective. I'm going to get a lot of hate mail. Paula. No, I don't think so. Um, I think we're about at time, but there is a question about what photographers are thinking when they take this image. And um, I think if you, there's some of that in the book, there's, there's, there are sort of a, some insider information here, as well as Peter's thoughts. Um, there's a lot to take in. Um, well, but hopefully I think it's a book that you will enjoy lingering with and, uh keep it by your side for many years i hope yes. <laughs> i still learn something from it every time i look at it ah so that's saying something yeah. well um you can order the book on peter's website you can see some of the images there go visit you can yeah. sign up to get the emails um please if you are new to pack la visit the pack la uh it's packlosangeles.org right um, is our website and we do lots of interesting programs some locally live in LA and some on zoom like you're seeing now so please uh, sign up to learn more about us and what we do and and take advantage of some of these great opportunities to hear from people like Peter and uh, and others talk about their passion for photography no, really I think we all we all enjoy having group therapy us addicts <laughs> <laughs> so PAC is a, is a wonderful resource for you all, and I would encourage you to join it and participate in their activities. They're, they're a great group of dedicated people, and they're very democratic. There's no elitism about it. So uh, uh, go join PAC, and maybe there are equivalents to PAC in your, in your own cities. I'm sure there's a lot of museums that have good support groups. And if they don't have one, start one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for all the kind words about PAC, Peter. Um, well, I mean it. That's why I'm here. Some... <laughs> exactly. This is why we wanted to work with you. Um, <laughs> I added those links in the chat as well. And also, please check back um, in a week or so for the recording of this. I forgot to buy one to our YouTube channel, but it's the same as our social media handle. It's just Photographic Arts Council Los Angeles. And there you'll find our archive of past talks and this one from today. So I just want to note that as well. All right, everyone. All right. Well, that's that. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Thank you all so much Thank for coming. Thank you all. Thank you, Pac. Thank it's you. Dot com, oh. not dot org. I'm just all kind of yeah, it's dot com. It's all in the chat. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, Thanks, Bailey. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Saturday, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.